Good afternoon. My name is Linda Protopappas. I'm the Executive Vice President of Sales for Health Recon Connect. Uh, welcome to our State Biomarker Laws webinar. Uh, the two gentlemen today that will be hosting this webinar is William Baus, who is our Director of Laboratory Services Support at Health Recon, as well as Dean Viskovich, uh, who is our attorney, who is an attorney that is, is joining William on this webinar. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Let me give you a brief description of both of them. Uh, for William, William has over 15 years of healthcare revenue cycle management. His last decade has been entirely focused on laboratory revenue cycle management, building onshore, offshore, and hybrid teams to satisfy the needs of clients. William has worked inside laboratories as the internal revenue cycle director with preview over every step of the revenue cycle process, as well as managing RCM vendors. William is tirelessly focused on compliantly maximizing the revenue cycle process uh, for laboratories, whether that is through uh, adoption of technology, application of deep state knowledge of payer and national coding policies, or providing access to relationships that he can change uh, bottom line for labs. Uh, Dean, welcome. Uh, Dean, Dean was admitted to the bar both in New York and Florida with over 25 years of experience as a trial attorney on behalf of the insurance companies and healthcare providers with emphasis on laboratory compliance and revenue cycle management issues related to health related to the healthcare sector. Formerly chief compliance officer and in-house corporate attorney for publicly traded and privately owned healthcare entities in Florida and Texas. Trial attorney for Royal Insurance Company and Nationwide Insurance before entering into private practice to represent healthcare providers in litigation against insurance companies. If you if anyone has any questions during this webinar, please feel free to raise your hand and I will call at you at any time. Um, or if you'd like to save them till the end, that is also fine. Also, just to let you know that we will be sending out a recording and the slide deck for this webinar, um, probably within a couple of days uh, after this is all set and ready to go. Again, thank you so much for attending. Gentlemen, if you'd like to start your webinar. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, we're here for the State Biomarker Laws with Health Recon, me and Dean. Let's move to the next slide. So our agenda today will be which states have current laws and which states have initiated legislation. Uh, then we're going to look at the main components of the biomarker laws. Like what is a biomarker? What testing methodologies and testing purposes and what coverage is in fact actually mandated by the law. And then we're gonna talk about payers, what payer types need to comply and what about pre-auth and credentialing and what about payer policies. And then we're even gonna take a look at, uh, because of one of the elements that we talk about in here is what is covered or FDA approved tests. I'm gonna take a look at and show you, hey, this is where you should probably go take a look and maybe future proof yourself uh, because we really did need this ray of sunshine because, you know, it's all gloom and doom about FDA regulating IBDs. And, um, you know, one of the ways to kind of be looking towards biomarker laws and be looking towards, um, you know, future proofing yourself from the FDA regulation and not spending $50,000 every time you want to bring an LDT to market. Uh, well, you could probably use FDA approved tests already and kind of get a double whammy for both. Um, let's see, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, and so, William, the overreaching thing is it's it's really good because it takes it from the experimental or the allegations from all of the third party payers that it, it, it lessens their reason to deny claims in, in, the, in the biomarker lab space. That's the bottom line. This gives us uh, a little more ammunition to say, hey, no, the states are acknowledging that this is medically necessary and you're going to have to uh, reimburse uh, the the lab if the if the lab jumps through enough enough hoops fair enough yeah well and and a real big thank you and shout out to the American Cancer Society also there's uh, another one that uh, I'll remember the name of that I also looked at as well but they're maintaining a fantastic website keeping it up to date with um, all of the different uh, states that have actually enacted legislation and which ones are on the books where it's been introduced but not been enacted. Oh, and I think another thing that's important too is just 
if a law is enacted doesn't necessarily mean it's been implemented. So uh, some of the uh, state laws that have been, quote unquote, inactive, that means they've been signed into law, but uh, they're not in, in force yet. You need to know when the implementation date is. And we'll be talking about that today, too. But for any particular state uh, that you're interested in, the red ones are uh, actually the ones that have been enacted, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're already implemented. And then the blue ones, they've been introduced in 2023, but have not yet been enacted. Uh, and then even after they get enacted, they'll be uh, dates of implementation. Like for example, Florida has been introduced. Uh, it has not been signed into law yet, but it already has an expected implementation date of January 1st of 2025. Um, you know, some of the other interesting things, uh, there have been a couple of different groups that have done uh, webinars regarding uh, this topic. Um, and, and they look at it from different perspectives. Of course, what we're going to be looking at is how can you as a lab use this to guide yourself in terms of what testing you want to do and what testing would be required coverage, right? But somebody like an Avalon is going to be looking at it in a much bigger viewpoint and how payers are looking at this as well. Um, and as you might guess, it doesn't seem like too many payers are super happy about it. They're concerned about how they're going to be able to comply with it and uh, the potential conflicts that we'll be talking about as we get into this. But one thing that did come up that was clear is that I think we can expect all of the states to follow suit because apparently this is considered a non, uh, it's, it's, it's bipartisan. And so whether you're a Republican or Democrat in the House wanting to fight about stuff, nobody's fighting about whether or not this stuff should happen. And apparently it's like a good way to be a rep and, and get noticed by your state is you're bringing all this new great healthcare coverage to, the, to your constituents. So I think what we can expect is how that relates to us is any states that are white right now, eventually they'll they'll have some laws like this, I think. I mean, uh, Dean, what's your take on that? I totally, totally agree. If, if you look at it, there is 14 states that now have those laws that have been enacted. Obviously, a lot of them, they're not, they don't have the effective date yet. Um, I think Texas as an effective date, actually the only one of, of January 1st of, of 2024. We looked at California, which was enacted in October of 2023 with an effective date of June 1 of 2024. New York was uh, uh, enacted also in 2023 and has an, uh, uh, an effective date as of April 1st, 2024. So these are very, very recent developments. Um, We've got 14 that have been enacted. There's another, I think, eight where it's been introduced and it's pending and it hasn't gotten approved by the legislature yet. But I definitely think this is a a, a bipartisan issue that goes across across both of the aisles. And it's something that um, um, uh, is more than likely going to get passed for that reason. I need to find some common ground. And... Um, taking a stand against the carrier, I think crosses both sides of the aisle, and it, it, it and and uh, it, 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 it's good for the people. Uh, that's the that's the bottom line. Um, when we talk about the biomarker and the genetic testing, I'm I'm going to let William get deep into what a biomarker is and what the testing methodologies are. I'm I'm not a clinician, obviously. William will talk deeper about that. But when we're when we're talking about genetics, and if you are a poor metabolizer or a super metabolizer, and the um, um, the results that that may have on on a di to diagnose and treat an individual are extremely important. So um, uh, obviously, the states, the state legislatures have also agreed that this is important, and that's why that they're implementing these laws. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, let's start diving in. Um, so what are biomarkers and then what's the biomarker definition? The image I pulled up on the right, I, I kind of did this on purpose because from a legal perspective or a legal statement kind of perspective and how they're looking at this, um, they're going to have very specific meanings about what they mean when they use, say, the term diagnostic, for example. Um, and then you'll you'll see other elements when they talk about that. But 
anything that's kind of that they're talking about here are definitely elements that are related to this plan. Just certainly understand it's not about screening and we'll talk about that in some detail. Okay, so the basic definition for a biomarker is verbatim across everybody that we've analyzed so far. Uh, I would expect that to be the same uh, as new legislation comes out. Biomarker means a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes. Um, and it is there that there might be a slight departure sometimes, and it looks like there's only two variations in the eight of them or so that I've looked at in a lot of detail. Um, one such variation might be that they actually mentioned pharmacologic responses, which that screams pharmacogenetic testing, right? PGX. Um, whereas sometimes it, it doesn't call that out specifically, but they talk about or responses to an exposure or intervention, including therapeutic interventions. And so that would include pharmacologic responses as well. So if somebody must have had PGX on the brain when they were writing this. Um, but as you can see, these would all kind of, these different things, prognostic, diagnostic, predictive, in the instance of predictive what, it, almost prescriptive of what drugs you should be taking. Um, and then of course they call out pharmacodynamics here and then there's recurrence, will it come back? These are all types of reasons why you would want and those would be considered medically necessary and related to exposure intervention and therapeutic interventions. But I think we probably nailed that. I think the only other thing to probably say about it is it's really broad because that's pretty much every kind of lab test we do. And in some of them, it looks like they even include radiologic type stuff too. So like CAT scans and x-rays might be on the menu for certain states. Uh, not super important for our labs, I suppose, but some of us are into multiple things, right? Dean, uh, yeah, and, and, and William, to, just to jump in, the definition of a biomarker is contained in each individual state's law. So mm -hmm. you could find it and you could read it, and there's not much, not much nuance or difference. Um, I don't know if somebody from one state is cut and pasting the definition of biomarker to another state, but um, they all have the same playbook when it comes to their definition of what a biomarker is and what a, a biomarker includes. Okay. So um, I just wanted to jump in and, and basically tell you that literally the definitions are contained within these new state laws. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we're still talking about the main components uh, and, and they talk in this instance, uh, they're trying to get a little bit more specific and tell you some idea of what they're looking at. And so it either breaks down into, they very explicitly mentioned gene mutations and protein expression, um, or they get even broader and they say molecular, histologic, radiographic, physiologic characteristics are types of biomarkers. Uh, and then they go on further to always have this sentence, which has confused me, and I haven't had a chance to ask you your take on this yet, Dean, so this will be interesting. Um, a biomarker is not an assessment of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. I'm, I'm just, I don't understand why they needed that sentence in there or thought that was important to be in there, but I'm like, okay, well, I guess that I, makes sense. I, I think when we, when we were in the lab world, we're looking for more objective findings as opposed to subjective Okay. okay. And when we okay. talk about how many feels or, or something like that, that's more a subjective. Um, I think in the lab world, we're more into finding a, a nanogram over a milligram amount of a percentage of something. And then the doctor is the one who interprets the lab report. And then based upon the doctor's interpretation, he could just diagnose and or treat. I think that's, I'm being kind, but that's what I think may be the intent of uh, that type of language. Okay, okay, yeah. I guess that makes sense because it's like, well, we're talking about lab tests and these are empirical, quantitative, data-driven type. Objective, objective. Objective exactly. analysis, yeah. Okay, all right, that, that makes sense. And, and so, you know, when you think about looking at gene mutations or protein expression, I mean, these are all different levels of you know, how deep down the rabbit hole do you go? You know, proteins are at a molecular level, but RNA is even down beneath that, right? With the DNA and then, you know, chemical products, if we're talking about 
various other like histologic or other molecular aspects. So I think this would include like blood testing and stuff if it wasn't already covered, you know, which mostly it is. And we'll get into the whole thing about what about their policy, this and what about frequency of testing and pre op We'll get into all of that. Um, all right. So. They also all say something about and biomarker testing includes. And again, we do seem to have two kind of major variations. Um, the, uh, the first one is they, they're, there's always, well, single analyte, multiplex, whole genome sequencing. So you can tell they're definitely thinking about it from, um, they're definitely thinking about it from the perspective of, uh, molecular, the newer type of testing. This is designed for them to be talking about the newer type of testing. Or it also will say something like it includes, but it's not limited to single analyte, multiplex, protein expression, whole exome, whole genome, whole transcriptome. Uh, and then this is one of the elements. Some of the states are putting in elements there about um, got to be a an in-network laboratory facility. And again, we're going to get into the whole thing about credentialing in its own right. Um explicitly, but that's not there in all states, right? So it doesn't mean, oh, I'm not in networks, so none of this matters. That's not what I'm saying here. Um, Dean, uh, do you have anything? Well, like I said, I'll, I'll defer to you when we talk about yep. the difference between the single analyte, the multi panel and the whole ge genome sequencing. Um, if you want me to jump in with respect to in-network versus not in-network, that, like I said, uh, that's why you need your lawyer to discuss with it and look at those state statutes. We've been spending time looking at New York, California, um, Texas, Florida, and each is different. New York specifically says, talks about a lab that's uh, a participating in-network um, laboratory facility. Texas doesn't mention in-network at all as a requirement. So if you're in Texas, you don't have to be a network. California does also does not specifically refer to an in-network laboratory. However, the California law refers to other California state statutes. And if you read those state statutes, there is some in-network language. So it's not really clear whether this new biomarker law for the state of California is going to require you to be a, a, a participating in-network provider. So you have the whole gambit from yes, you've got to be, to maybe, to absolutely not. And that's three that we were looking at. So um, there's, two, you know, there's 14 out there. You got to do that same type of analysis on all of them. Excellent. And I did want to make one point very, very clear, um, and I think it's worth talking about the difference between diagnostic and screening. Um, I think everybody on the call is probably intimately familiar with, um, you know, what just happened to us in COVID. And if you recall, in the beginning, they said, um, ah, yeah, you don't need a physician order. And then like, Four months later, they were like, yeah, now wait a minute. After the first one, you probably start need, you need to have a physician diagnosing you uh, with a reason for the test. Um, and, and what you realize there is that it became very distinct to me about what does a payer mean by diagnostic testing? I mean, inherently, a diagnostic test, you would think, is a diagnostic test. But from a payer's perspective, it's a diagnostic test when it's related to the condition of the patient, as opposed to going out and shotgun testing everybody to find people who have a problem. And that's kind of what I put there for that little funnel is like, that's screening. Diagnostic is when somebody's looked at you and decided that you have signs, conditions, indications, diagnostic codes that would relate to supporting the medical necessity for the ordering of a test to can carry on and continue your treatment. So, and they do throw in this language here for the diagnosis, treatment, appropriate management and ongoing monitoring of an enrollee's disease or condition to guide treatment decisions. So definitely it's diagnostic, it's not for screening. Like an example of something that a 
lot of people ask me about um, is, oh, what about liquid biopsy? And well, well, first of all, liquid biopsy is just talking about the you're not taking a, you know, a tissue biopsy where you go in and cut somebody open, you're taking it out of their blood. But the test that you're doing is going to be a similar kind of test. But usually when somebody's talking about, um, you know, a liquid biopsy, they're talking about like this shotgun thing of, well, I'm going to go in there and look for 30 different kinds of cancer markers for you. That's not going to be diagnostic unless you have conditions for it. Like if, for example, the person does have pancreatic cancer, let's say, and they're going through a course of treatment and somehow there's a test you've got looking at biomarkers about how the patient is responding to um, the treatment that they're receiving. I don't know, and I'm going off the roadmap here real quick, but maybe there's more cancer cell shedding or less cancer cell shedding. And just the quantification of that is useful in determining that the treatment is helpful to the patient. Well, in that case, a, you know, a liquid biopsy would be or would have medical necessity, but not this stuff that people are doing where we're testing for every possible condition of a known cancer and there's no clinical trials and it doesn't have any condition related to the patient. That wouldn't be diagnostic. So as so long as you're doing diagnostic testing, which means to break it down in its most fundamental element, you have a doctor looking at the patient and determining that there's a condition that has arisen that requires additional testing to clarify so that they can manage the ongoing treatment of the patient. Well, then you're, that's we meet that criteria. We'll be diagnostic. Yeah. William, to, to jump in, obviously, guys, third party payers, they only like to, to reimburse providers for things that are medically necessary, which is kind of the same thing as uh, um, uh, for diagnostic purposes, which is easy to usually to diagnose or treat their patients. That's the bottom line. OK, perfect example. If we remember what was going on during the PHE with COVID out in California, there was SB 510, the bill out there, and it specifically covered diagnostic and screening. So the third party payers were on the hook up until basically November of 2023 to pay for screening as well as the diagnostic COVID testing. The rationale was there was the PHE, there was a big problem and they want to err on the side of caution and to uh, have the third party payers pay for that. They weren't thrilled with it. Usually third party payers do not pay for screening. So when we go to the biomarker thing, it's the same thing. The, the overreaching macro view of a third party payers they only want to pay for things that are are, are medically necessary and and to help in uh you know the di to help in the to diagnose or treat patients. That's the bottom line. So this is really no different than any other um, testing or services that that providers would like to get reimbursed by the payers from. Excellent, excellent. Um, all right, let's move on. All right, so what's covered? Um, well, first let's talk about credentialing. And I use the term credentialing as separate from being in network or out of network because I intend to use that term to talk about payers that have no concept of out of network benefits. Um, <clears throat> and so to be clear, Medicare, for example, you either are credentialed with Medicare and you will be paid, or you are not credentialed with Medicare and you won't be paid. Uh, HMOs, health maintenance organizations, or MCOs, managed care organizations, are of this same vein. They don't have a concept of a plan where a patient can go to a doctor who is, or a laboratory, who is outside of their closed network. And so that's the whole point of what an HMO was or an MCO was. Um, so, yes, Linda, I'll, I'll allow me to finish this slide out and then we'll we'll go for that question. Um, and so uh, commercial payers, and this is, I think, something that's useful information just for everybody. Um, so commercial payers have plans and you can think 80, 90 percent of the time, anybody who has a commercial plan will also have the ability like a PPO plan to go out of network. They're allowed to choose their own physician and they pay a premium for doing so. 
Um, <clears throat> and those are the payers that you be in network with or out of network with, and you can be an out of network lab and you can pretty much bet if somebody's got Blue Cross Blue Shield, even though you're out of network, you're going to at least get adjudicated and maybe paid. They might move it all towards the deductible because it's $10,000, but um, you will still get paid. If you try to bill an HMO that you are not credentialed with, well, the denial usually comes back as some kind of a pre-auth, which is kind of a, a, a wild goose chase because you try to go and get a pre-auth and what they're going to do is say, oh yeah, tell me who you are. And then, then you say who you are and they're like, I don't know who you are. You need to go talk to credentialing. So then we'll talk to you about doing this pre-auth. Um, so if you're not credentialed with an HMO or MCO, they're going to be under no obligation to pay you. It doesn't waive the credentialing rights as it did say, under the mandate for COVID, where whether you were an HMO or MCO, whether you were contracted or not, uh, they were still under a mandate to pay you. That is not the case with this law. I think that's the big thing to get across with that. Um, additionally, uh, there are a number of states in the plans that might mention that you need to be in network for them, for the payer to be required to pay you for it. So that's not all states. New York is clearly one that doesn't mention that. Uh, New York and Florida are pretty specific about that. It definitely says you need to be an in-network uh, provider. Uh, California is unclear, and I'm going to let Dean talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but like California, I noticed, and I think it, New York did the same thing too. They already had laws on the books for various different types of biomarker mandates. So they, when they wrote their state law for biomarkers, they're referencing, oh, for these payers, for these things, you have to do this. And so California is kind of unclear about that, whereas New York is pretty clear, Florida is pretty clear, Texas is clear that you don't have to be in network. So it, there will be some of this variation across the states. Um, and then if there is or our payer uh, pre-authorization requirements for a particular biomarker already in place, there's no waiver of that. You're still going to have to comply with the pre-authorization certification process. And interestingly, also, every one of the laws that I read through also mandates that there has to be a good, um, I don't think they actually call it appeals process, but they call it... Um, a process for resolving disputes or something like that. And yeah, I mean, all commercial payers already have uh, an appeal process in place. Although I just saw something released from Medicare today about increasing that access and opening up APIs to allow for pre-authorizations to happen uh, electronically. So this is going to be an evolving scenario about how hard is it to do uh, and uh, whether or not they're, they're going to require those things. As far as payer policy. And I was so happy to hear Dean tell me the answer to this. But obviously, if there's no policy, well, then, you know, what the state law said, and then that's going to apply. But what happens if, for example, Dean, the same question we had earlier, uh, mm -hmm. let's say we're talking about PGX. And let's say I'm talking about a Medicaid that um, they clearly have a, a policy in place. And they say the whole uh CPY 450 chromosome, P450 chromosome is experimental investigational. And that's where a lot of my stuff lives for what CPIC and the FDA already say, which are the nationally recognized standards, right? Um, what would happen if the payer says, oh, that's experimental investigational, but according to this law, if I have nationally recognized guidelines, um, what, what would happen in such a scenario, D? Well, here's the situation, okay? The state law will trump or the, the state law will apply and the and the payer policies have to be in compliance with, with the state law. If there's no state law on biomarker, then the, the default is the language in the policy. Pretty simple, okay? The perfect example of the payers having to comply with the state law that they don't like is what I just previously spoke about with SB 510, the law in California with respect to COVID, where they included screening 
and diagnosed and diagnosed um, diagnostic tested as a covered service. Those carriers had to pay for all that screening, and as soon as they, that that ended, they said, "Absolutely not. We're no longer going to be paying screening because that state law is no longer applicable." Okay, so this is a very analogous concept to that. Um, that basically you're holding the carrier's feet to the fire. Now that you have a state law, they need to comply with it. If they don't, you would make an appeal uh, to the payer. If the payer still denies it, then the next logical step, step would go to the Department of Insurance in that state and say, hey, we have a new state law about biomarker. My test is FDA approved and I meet it meets the definition of what a biomarker test is and it and it meets the definition of FDA approved and I've jumped through all those things and they still won't pay me. Please, Department of State, um, could you weigh in on here and basically instruct the carrier that they have to uh, comply with the state law? And then the, and then the ultimate um, resolution would be, you could also go to court and you can institute a declaratory judgment action on the issue of coverage and say, hey, judge, there's a new state law that covers biomarkers. They're still saying, by they, I mean, that third party payers are saying it's experimental and investigational and it's not covered. But the state law certainly seems to say, no, that's not the case. You need to pay for it. OK, so that's the process that the uh, the provider needs to go through and the carriers need to go through the same process as well. Excellent. OK, you know, I wonder. Also, you know, it, it kind of it, it catches me wrong that Florida and New York are saying that you have to be in network. Do um, you think there's anything we'll ever be able to do about that? <laughs> I mean, because like we can't get in network sometimes. Right. I mean, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. Very 100%. few people can't have get that. Right? Blue. Yeah. No, but I, um, you know, you're you're at the you're at at the mercy of the of the state legislatures to be honest with you as mm. whoever their lobbyists are and things like that and it's funny you brought up new york and then network because if you read the language it's that you know it's really really interesting because they talk about um the um they were talking about that the network lab needs to be a um clear what are they they call it a CLIA um, certified or a CLIA wave lab. It, it specifically talks about um, that's the type of labs um, that need to run this biomarker testing. And it's odd because in the state of New York, um, you're not, you don't have to have a CLIA certification or a CLIA waiver. And quite a few labs in New York don't have a CLIA certification or a CLIA waiver. And if any and if any third party payer wants to be somewhat cute and apply the law to the facts and say, hey, you're not a CLIA certified or a CLIA waived lab, that's the only type of lab that is allowed to run these uh tests pursuant to this new New York statute. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> So, uh, so each one is nuanced, and I'm going to basically, you know, we're going to talk about, we haven't spoken too much about, number one, Medicaid. Medicaid are state programs. Most of these are applicable to Medicaid. Specifically, California does specifically talks about Medi-Cal and says, no, this doesn't apply to California Medicaid only because it refers to uh, existing California state law that covers biomarker testing through uh, Medi-Cal, okay? So for the most part, who's required to reimburse for this? Medicaid, all the state Medicaids, not Medicaid. Remember, Medicare is a federal program, so you have to be careful. Uh, you have to look to the LCDs, the NCDs for the max that cover your state to see if you are going to get reimbursed for biomarker testing on the federal level for those Medicare beneficiaries. So it's a, a two-pronged approach and attack. Um, I know we're going to talk about 
the uh, relevance and the significance of NCDs and LCDs as far as what is covered coming up pretty soon as well. So um, okay. we'll deal with yeah. that pretty soon. Okay. And then, uh, so we did have a, a question, uh, two questions. Um, the question was, uh, we are speaking a lot about PGX for oncology. Um, I'm not, I'm talking about PGX in general, but, um, yeah, there's got a, there's a lot of PGX for oncology stuff. Um, do some of these laws also apply to PGX testing for mental health? Uh, checking for efficacy of antidepressants. Yeah, it, it'll it'll work for all types of it. I mean, it's just yeah, going to go. Broad. So they're going to go by what's that? These statutes are pretty broad in in, in the services that are, are covered under it. Right, and I mean, so the nationally recognized body standards are going to be CPIC and then the FDA therapeutic recommendations. Um, so CPIC level A or B or FDA therapeutic recommendations table, which is different than their black box warning of what's on the actual medication list of which there's only like, I think three or maybe five of them. It's much broader for therapeutic recommendations. There's about 196 different gene drug combinations, SSRIs, tricyclics, yes, those are definitely covered. And in, in fact, you can tell by the way that, um, well, they made that code 81418, which must include 2D6 and 2C19, plus at least a minimum of four other genes. That's definitely designed exactly for this. Those, uh, These state laws, all of them are saying yes to that. What we're doing is describing some of the, well, maybe in this state, you'd have to be a network to be able to do it. If you're talking about an HMO that you want to get paid from and you're not credentialed with them, it's not going to work, right? But if you are credentialed with them, um, or even in states where you don't have to be in network like Texas, right? Well, then you're going to be fine in Texas. Um, and that's actually something we'll we'll keep up for for later. I'd I'd like to kind of post myself a question. Um, exactly how are we going to talk about doing this? I mean, if it's underwritten in Texas, then they would be subject to the Texas Department of Insurance, I think. But think about that for a second, so we can get back to that at the end because it just kind of popped up in my head. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, this is going to apply to all, all PGX that's in alignment with the standards. Um, and so let's talk about that now. That's, this is the big, this is the big slide that takes a minute to get through. So all of the laws are clear about these three elements. Um, it's either going to be an FDA approved uh, or cleared test. So, in fact, at the end of this, I, I did a little bit of digging just to kind of give you a smattering of, well, there are FDA approved tests for these different kinds of tests. That might be something worth looking into, not only for uh, acceptance from a biomarker uh, law perspective, but also kind of future proofs you from needing to be <laughs> FDA approved when, if that ever comes to fruition for the FDA, where they now want to enforce their discretion of regulating lab developed tests as in vitro diagnostics. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later then, but yeah, if it's an FDA approved test, you're in like Flynn. Um, an indicated test for a drug approved by the FDA. Uh, so one that jumps to mind would be those black box warnings on there, but there's obviously more there. But the real meat for me comes into NCDs and LCDs, and then I've got another slide about nationally recognized um, standards. Uh, but this one's great. In some of the ways they wrote this law, it's kind of like, um, it's super broad, right? In Texas, they're they're like, yeah, any NCD or any LCD. So <laughs> that's got to freak out the payers, right? They're like, oh my God, you're reversing it on us, right? Exactly. Um, but somebody like California uh, literally explicitly stated, uh, you know, using California LCDs. And so what's interesting about that? So not only do I have it at the nationally recognized standards level for CPIC, uh, I've also, if I'm in California, I've got, well, I, I have an LCD that explicitly references that national re nationally recognized guideline. So if I've got a payer in California trying to pull that crap on me that uh, the P450 chromosome and 
is no is experimental investigational. I, I'm ready to go to town on them, man. We could have such a great appeal for it because it, we've got all the documentation is so clear. It's very well defined. I'm, I'm, I've been hating to tell people all the time. They're like, oh, you know, I want to do PGX. And, and I'm like, yeah, it's predominantly a Medicare play. I mean, there's a couple of benefit policy managers that will pay for it. So like Blue Texas and Illinois that are managed by Carolan and anybody that would be managed by Carolan, well, they're referencing CPIC. It's almost like they knew this was going to happen. Um, so very exciting news, I think, from a PGX perspective, but also other tests as well, right? Um, but what I usually think of for a healthy lab is that lab should be able to get paid for testing, not just from one kind of payer, like just Medicare. Medicare decides to break wind the wrong way, your whole business model goes poof, right? Well, um, now we can uh, get, get access to the other Medicaid. Some of, some of them do pay, but most of them don't. Um, and we'll get access to the commercial payers. And in certain states, we won't even have that in-network requirement. So FDA approved it cleared. If you know you've got NCDs or LCDs and you can get paid in certain places, but not in other places, that's where this law is just going to be able to, to help you do that, right? And a billing company who's down with and understands how to do appeals and can incorporate your legal jargon that you want to throw into this um, are going to be the kinds of companies that are going to help you apply these biomarker laws to your benefit. Um yeah. I yeah. agree. Well, that's why William and I are here, and that's why HRC has this as well. You have to look at these state laws and see what they are actually applying to or what they are referencing to. And the big buzzword is in each one of these laws, they are incorporating by reference federal rules and regulations by literally saying, hey, what biomarker laws are covered? Obviously, if you have an FDA approved biomarker test that's terrific however they also say hey if you look at the ncds or the lcds and they contain a biomarker approved test then that's also going to be covered as well and we i hate to get use the word granular and if and you look at the state laws and what they say california says yeah if there's an lcd but they talk about the lcd that's issued by a mac with the with the jurisdiction of California, so that is what that's Noridian, correct? Uh, right, that's the uh, that's the Mac that covers California. So so those uh, Noridian LCDs are are applying for those biomarker tests that are contained in the LCDs for Noridian. However, if you look at Texas's law, it's kind of a Pandora box, and it talks about yeah, you could follow LCDs. But it doesn't say only the LCD that applies to the state of Texas, i.e. Novitas. Okay, so what it's saying, if you read the plain language, it could be First Coast, it could be Novitas, it could be the LCD of any of the Macs out there. If they are, um, uh, if, if they are acknowledging that type of test as a covered service. The argument could be in Texas, you could rely on that to to uh, as support to get reimbursed under the state law for biomarker testing in, in Texas. William, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. So I don't know if that was their intent, but it's certainly there as well. Okay, so you Brilliant. need to look, uh, you know, to see where what the LCDs. And what the uh, 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 LCDs, what states they are limited to? Okay, uh, the the uh, LCD in the in the New York law is not limited to strictly the New York LCD. So California is the one that has that added yep. layer that you need to be aware of. So a lot of I don't know if this is interesting or boring you to death. But there needs to be a state-by-state -state analysis of each state that you're doing business in, in your lab with respect to biomarket testing to determine um, how to get reimbursed. That's the bottom line.
And that's why William and here, this is what we do three, through HRC to maximize the lab's reimbursement in the most legal and compliant way that we can. Awesome. Um, there, there was a, a comment um, from a well-respected uh, um, medical doctor and geneticist. Um, and it, it seemed like maybe what I said was that CYP is covered. And if I said that, I didn't mean to say that. What I am saying is that for CYP 2D6, 2C9, 2C19, what is referenced in the CPIC guidelines that are nationally recognized and also listed in the NCDs and LCDs, whatever they say in there that that's covered, that's what's going to be covered, right? It's Correct. not everything. And so that's a, that's a good Correct. point. Thank you, sir. Correct. It's not, um, nothing, everything is not covered, okay? You have to basically look to see what the sources they're referring to in there. It is pretty broad, however, which is a good news. So then um, nationally recognized clinical guidelines. So they kind of go, they're more specific and more specific, and then they work into this not so specific element. And in other webinars I've watched, this is what really freaks out the payers. They do not like this language here. And so I, I kind of think you're going to have probably best results if we're kind of focused on well, an FDA-approved test, I think we're going to not really get attacked and have a lot of back and forth about who's got the better standards, right? And I think when you've got an NCD, uh, there's going to be less back and forth. LCDs, and because Medicare has different LCDs that are sometimes in conflict with each other, I can already start to see, well, we don't like that LCD. We like this one kind of an argument going on. Um, but again, that's a lot more clear and we'll probably already have backing it up nationally recognized clinical guidelines, right? So then if you strip away FDA and you strip away NCD and you strip away LCD, what you're left with is you're nationally recognized clinical guidelines. And it's at that point that, well, they might, they might want to use these people or those people. And so you can kind of see some of these get referenced here. But first of all, what is an, a, a nationally recognized clinical guideline? Two big things that seem to be there is that there can't be a conflict of interest in, in some of the variation of what they say. They actually say that, right? Or um, I think in this one, that it says the they published articles for review by experts who are not paid editorial staff, right? So they don't want any conflict of interest introduced into it. And so CPIC and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, these guys are that, right? Um, and what you'll notice is in some of the laws, they uh, they don't specify it like Texas. So Texas seems to have taken a more, you know, I don't think ambiguous is the right word, but less specific, but more and more generic, which is better, I think, from our perspective. The more broad generic it is, the better and more applicable it might be for us as a lab to pick it up and use it to prosecute payment. Um and then so, so like uh, in California, they actually call out the National Academy of Medicine to give you an example of um, what is a nationally recognized clinical guideline. But they also say, but not limited to, right? So they're not limiting it to it. They just kind of threw one out so you'd get an idea of what they're talking about. Uh, I think it also kind of shows who's been helping them do it because like, the guys that did that website, obviously, been talking to these guys in California and in New York, right? Um, and, you know, the American Society of Clinical Oncology or CPIC would be uh, a nationally recognized standard, which has already been incorporated into an LCD in um, six of the max, right? It, everybody except uh, national government services. They're the only ones that don't actually have uh, a PGX LCD put together yet. They just got it kind of buried in a bunch of biomarkers, right? Yeah, they're they're trying to get to be more objective than subjective in a lot of these recognized clinical guidelines. They feel that they are not as objective as they would like them to be, and they don't like to rely on them. Perfect example, William, when we, if we talk about the MOLDX and the Z codes and things like that, and all the difficulties that all of our lab clients have had, trying to get a technical assessment through and we have the clinical utility and the, and the clinical validity and the utility is based on these national recognized guidelines 
that would be submitting to try to get the technical assessment approved. And even the CMS and the MACs would routinely just reject them as good as, you know, the periodicals that uh, a lot of uh, clinicians were providing as uh, nationally recognized guidelines to for the testing that was done. So I think that's not a terrible analogy. You could you could weigh in and tell me that, uh, you know, what do you think? But that's, you know, that's the situation once you get to that type of level. Excellent. So I'm going to speed through. This last slide was meant to just recap some things. We do have a question. And then I want to show you some of the little bit of research I did on the FDA website for some FDA approved tests. So you can kind of get a look at that. And there's a lot more than what I'm going to show you that there could be to look at. But everybody's like, oh, what's next? What should I be doing? Well, in this instance, I think it's you got to you got two reasons to want to look at FDA approved tests. Um, but the question was, when an LCD and an NCD conflict, what takes precedence? So I'm going to sound like stupid, and I would be re I would be happy for you to 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 call me out and tell me when you've seen a conflict. I think sometimes what looks like a conflict may not be one. Like, let me give you an example in the context of PGX. You look at the LCDs, they talk about PKORC1 being paid, um, and they give you the criteria under which it'll pay, be paid, but there's a um, uh, an NCD about that. And also, so the CPIC lists it as, I think, a level A or a B, right? And for warfarin, right? But um, when you look at the NCD, the NCD talks about it and says, only under these conditions, and it's basically, you got to be in a clinical trial. So I... I don't expect to be paid for that because I've got an NCD telling me that, yeah, we kind of agree with it, but we don't want to pay for it because of um, you know, whatever reason they have for that. I don't really know why, but they want you to be in a clinical trial before they're going to pay for it. And that usually means nobody's going to, well, not many people would qualify for that. Um, and I'd be surprised if they're still doing clinical trials about it now, since everybody already kind of knows the answer to that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and Chris Walls has, has has said an NCD always trumps an LCD. I would correct. I would agree with that. But yeah, I would say, too. Yeah, I would. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, although sometimes I think that it looks like a conflict and it's not, and I, I'm ready to be, um, you know, stumped on that anytime anybody wants to. If you send me an email, I'd be interested in, in seeing that because sometimes I think they're not conflicting; they're just additive like yeah CPIC says it they would pay for it except now the NCD says you need to be in a they've modified it that you need to be in a clinical trial so I don't really see that as conflicting they're not they're not saying it that CPIC is wrong they're just saying we don't want to pay for it um overlapping NCD yep all right uh so why don't I pull up the the uh spreadsheet I prepared for um uh this little talk here just to show you that there are that and then uh, anybody that's got questions uh, please start putting them in uh, and then if you want to talk I think we can even click a button let you talk to but um, <clears throat> so I just did a, a couple of them just, just to show you that they they do exist right um, and there's a lot more of them can be really related to oncology. There's a nice list of all these, you know, individual type genes where you're doing, you know, fixed paraffin tissue and it's related to oncology, which I somewhat eschewed because I rarely run into laboratories that have relationships with oncologists. But if you do have relationships with oncologists, there are a lot of FDA approved tests and there's a lot of work you can do there for NGS. Um, for example, there's uh, like even BRCA, for example, is, you know, if you do that right, that's the this one here, the ovarian cancer one, um, you know, deletion, duplication, BRCA1 and BRCA2, it's it's almost $2,000 and it would probably cost $4,000 or excuse me, $400 to run it. But, you know, it probably costs a little bit more when you're using the FDA uh, approved version of it because you'll have to pay them more money a little bit. But you know, we have STI, infectious disease, um, FDA approved tests. And so really then the question, and this is what uh, the expected Medicare allowable would be for these kind of tests. Uh, you know, so I would look at 
well, how much does it actually cost you to implement that FDA approved test? And if there's a good profit margin there, that probably makes sense to look at adopting that into your laboratory because I've said it now three times. I hope I'm not beating that horse to death too much. But if you um, if you want to future proof yourself for what the FDA might do in the future, plus also to be in alignment with a biomarker law, doing an FDA approved test would be a good path to that. Um, and so, you know, there's even a fungal panel, which is interesting because the syndromic panel LCDs in uh, any of the Moldex Max are, they literally state in the LCD that they don't think oncomycosis needs to be done in a um, PCR method. But it looks like, yeah, they're not even doing it in a PCR method. So I guess everybody should be happy with that. I'm just surprised that it breaks out to being worth that much. Um and then, you know, another STI here, we've got some influenza, you've got your, your women's health panel here. This one is a very nice one too, because uh, I, I, I like the panels that are covered federally and commercially. And, you know, in a lot of commercial payers, uh, the same required diagnostic code that you would have for this versus say Candida, it's the same set of diagnostic codes, but this test is worth like, 200 and, uh, well, 244, $45, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I like that test. And, and commercially speaking, it's paid for. Federally speaking, it's paid for. Uh, it's great. And it includes kind of like a, a, an algorithm that is, takes the data from the result as well as patient level data that kind of synthesizes that and gives you a risk score. Um another multiplex panel here exists. So I just kind of wanted to give you an example that, yeah, there are FDA approved tests out there. Uh, trying to get a 510K yourself is a rather involved process um, and can take some time. Uh, and, you know, you're probably more of a research oriented lab by the time you're trying to do that kind of stuff. But uh, there are plenty of people who've already, you know, paid the pathway uh, for you. And if there are predicate tests out there, that does make it easier for you to do it. Um, and eventually you may have to do it anyway. So um, I would take a good look at those now. All right. I uh, don't see any open questions. Um, Dean, do you have any closing remarks? No, I, um, like I said, uh, HRC, William, they do a, a terrific job. Um, we do a lot of analysis with respect to LCDs and the uh, MCD and the NCDs on the federal side. We do a lot of analysis on the payer side as well in each individual state. So we're happy to answer any questions that you might have, not only with biomarker, infectious disease, any of the toxicology or the blood as well. So um, William is the, the, the individual who could certainly... Uh, lead lead you and your lab to basically maximizing your reimbursement in the most legal and compliant way. Thank you. Thank you. Do, you do we have any other questions for William or for Dean? Gentlemen, I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you both for, for presenting. Oh, wait, William has something. <laughs> Disclaimer, right? We're not offering legal advice. We're not giving you coding advice. If you're going to do any of this, call us, work with us, work with your experts. Um, yeah, don't, don't implement any of this without talking to somebody that you trust uh, and work with. <laughs> perfect. Agreed. Perfect. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for your time. And thank you're you welcome. for everyone who participated in our webinar, who joined. Um, again, we'll be, we will be sending out the slide deck as well as this recording. Um, if you would like to get in contact with Dean or William, please respond to the email with the information and we can connect you with them. Uh, with that being said, this is the close of our webinar. And again, thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you all.